Okay, so we want to go from theory to practice uh, in an hour session. Uh, it's going to be, uh, hopefully it's going to work for you guys. Um, and I have a, a Google Colab notebook that is completely self-contained for the second and a half of the, of, the, of the talk. So in principle, it just click and you can replicate uh, the process on, on, on data that is hosted on, on Amazon. Uh, so, um, as many of the uh, as many of know, um, um, noise is a huge issue in system neuroscience. We are tackling um, uh, neurons that are like hidden in a, in a in a skull that are hard to reach, and as a result, uh, anything any methods that we use to record uh, boost neurons is is poised to uh, to measurement errors. Um, and two thought on calcium imaging in particular. In, in some ways you could argue is just flooded with short noise. Uh, so here I have an example, a 30 Hertz movie recorded the Allen Institute in some conditions. Um, so that will be representative of certain kind of experiments. People might see different results, but usually what you, what you see at, at conferences is um, some kind of average of these. And so I'm gonna show you here the raw, the raw data uh, from for that experiment. And the, the first thing you notice is all of this speckle across the entire field of view. And, and, and this is due to a, a, a very low light uh, regime. And so the, you're essentially looking at the quantization of light. And in that regime, the, the sinite to nose ratio is, is proportional to the square root of the number of photons as, as shown on the right. Before we, we dive into this, I wanna, I wanna try to sort of share an intuition about where this is coming from. Um, and so this is the first time I'm trying to sort of describe this analogy and I hope it's gonna go uh, well. Uh, so let's imagine you're uh, you two person are trying to communicate um, and man one is, is, um, is, 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 is as a flashlight and he's looking at a little firefly that is close by. And he's trying to communicate to man two, but it's very far away, the intensity of the firefly. And so the intensity is changing over time. So he needs to find some kind of scheme to communicate the intensity of the firefly to this man. Is there a question? Oh no, to this man number two that is very far away that cannot see the firefly. And he only has a flashlight that can only turn on and off with very bright light. And so it's likely that the two men are going to converge into some kind of temporal scheme uh, where they turn the man one turn on the light very frequently when the light is very intense of the firefly and slowly decrease the frequency of his, of his uh, uh, turning on and off of the, uh, of the flashlight when the light is getting very dim. And at some point, you're going to get a regime where the light of the firefly is so dim that uh, man number one will have to sort of turn on the flashlight very, uh, to be time very long, but a very long apart. And so, so essentially you, you end up with uh, a communication bottleneck because you, 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 you need more time to encode this very dim light when you have this very, very strong flashlight. And so I argue this is actually what's going on in our case, that man number two is our PMT and, and, and man number one is the photon emission. Um, and so the reason I'm, I'm making this analogy is in, in, in many cases we treat shot noise as noise, but in fact, I think it's part of your signal. Uh, and, and, and the reason why we see this fluctuation is because we're not giving enough time to communicate the very low value with these very bright, bright photons. So uh, one way, one way to, and, and this has consequence to the entire processing pipeline, uh, and I'm, I'm sure Andrea will touch upon this, but uh, the, the presence of this very large fluctuation is causing issue with motion correction, segmentation, extracting traces, extracting events. So it, this is the core of many of the problems in two photon microscopy. Uh, and so for many years, I thought, and, and, and you can actually see, we did a review with uh, Natalia Olova and Benjamin Gru on all of the technique in two photon space. And you actually see this constraint uh, of the photon regime being low um, when you plot the number of, 
of neurons that are recorded against the sampling frequency. So essentially every technique is trying to find a different trade-off uh, and, and distribute its photons differently. And you have this inverse relationship here. And so for, for many years, I thought uh, the only solution is to improve the instrument. Uh, we have to collect more photons or collect more information from the sample. Uh, and so with Mark Schitzer, we developed some tools and uh, as other people in the field, as Spencer and many others have done to have more beam scanning the tissue. And so this way you actually give more time uh, per beam to, to encode this very low light regime. Uh, but in fact, uh, this is sort of uh, not taking into account a uh, critical piece of information that we are collecting from the tissue. Because in fact, pixels that are nearby each other, they share information about their respective values. So uh, if you, and, and, and I'm highlighting this on these slides. So if you, if you measure the mutual information between a pixel and its neighbor, either in space or in time, you see uh, on panel B here, as, you're, as you move uh, from the center pixels to the, the, the pixel on the sides, uh, there is a fair amount of information that sort of is present in nearby pixels. And what that means is you actually can use those pixels to reconstruct the center pixels. It shares some insight uh, about the value uh, uh, of that pixels. And, and that, that in effect, if you were able to leverage this, you will ex essentially increase the throughput, increase the information throughput of the photons uh, to, your, to, your, to, your, uh, to your recording. And the same thing happened in time. Uh, so there's actually a relationship between space, uh, of, between pixels that are in space and time around your center pixel. And so uh, one, way, one way then uh, to think about it is that if you could actually extract all uh, near, use all nearby pixels and extract what they contain, uh, uh, the information we contain about the center pixel, you essentially uh, greatly increase the photon throughput um, and, and potentially eliminate short noise uh, or reduce this effect of having uh, quantized information. So the, then the question is transformed into how can we learn this really complex spatial temporal relationship between nearby pixels? Um, obviously, the, 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 you will think uh, one classical approach is to use machine learning. Um, and, and from the issue there is that in, in neuroscience, uh, uh, typically when you try to, to do this approach of learning this relationship, you need ground truth data. You need uh, a, a piece of data that give you what is the relationship between this nearby pixel and the center uh, and, and what is the ground truth underneath. And because this way you actually can uh, learn, learn this relationship. Uh, but this change, uh, this, this uh, sort of state of the art changed a couple of years ago when uh, a paper came out in uh, like a purely machine learning paper called Noise to Noise. And so what they, they did is, uh, uh, is, is when using, if you, if you try to learn, uh, say a denoising uh, uh, filter, uh, the traditional approach on the left is to have pairs of image, one of the one noisy image and a clean image, and you repeat this so as to learn the relationship, the nonlinear relationship underneath. Uh, but if you only had noisy instances of the image, in fact, the signal is hidden into, into the image. And so if you have the same image with different instances of the noise on, on top, uh, and you actually train a network to reconstruct that noisy instance, because noise is independent, it cannot be predicted. And so as you train this network, what happens is is going to try to minimize its loss. And, 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 and the loss is actually an, a, a, an unbiased estimate uh, of the signal. And so uh, it's actually going to converge to the right solution. So what happens is as you train this network, uh, it's going to try to predict this noisy instance, but in fact, it's going to predict the clean image underneath because the, 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 the mean of the noises is actually zero in, in those cases. So this is what, this is the insight that we leverage, uh, this, this, uh, this paper. And there are other uh, uh, publications called Noise to Voice and, and Noise to Self that also propose to use this approach. And we transform it to, uh, to, uh, to make it more practical for calcium imaging. 
So what you see uh, on this figure is that is, is the principle of this approach. Uh, so during training, uh, instead of using uh, pairs of image where we have different instances of noise on top, we transform into this into an interpolation problem. So think about uh, the center image uh, of a two photon movie, say one, one sample here. And what you want to do is, is use nearby pixels in time to predict that center frame. And so we, we train the network to use, say, 30 frames before the center frame and 30 frame after the center frame uh, to predict the center image. And because noise is independent, uh, it's not going to be able to predict it. And it's going to find the mean of all possible solution. And the mean of all possible solution is actually the signal in the case of short noise. And so you train this. Uh, and as you train, the loss is going to go down, as you see on this plot. And it's never going to go to zero because it cannot predict that independent noise. So it is going to converge to this independent noise floor. And so it's a little unusual as machine learning go because uh, you don't want to achieve noise uh, a loss of zero because you cannot you cannot get there. Um, and so if you were to get there, that would mean you are just overfitting the the noise. Uh, so during inference, when you've done this training, you just retake this uh, network and you reapply it. Uh, and the, the value of this approach is it's entirely self-supervised. So you actually can train this denoiser on your, on your single movie itself. Uh, and, 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 adv and another advantage is uh, when you do two-photon microscopy, typically we, we record movies that are an hour long. Uh, so that means you have uh, likely hundreds of thousands of frames of data, which you can use to train these denoisers. So it's plentiful. Uh, so this is a, an example, a network structure uh, that we can discuss uh, in the second half if you're interested. Uh, so, uh, and, and we, we looked a little bit about what are the uh, meta parameters that are helpful. Um, but um, essentially you, you, you take this 30 frame before the movie, 30 frame after, before the center frame, you predict that center frame, and this is this noisy instance here. As you train, you converge to this, which is the, uh, the, the mean of all possible uh, pairs. Uh, the structure is a, of the network is it? Sorry, do you want, I just want, you said you could, I could interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure, there's please a, do. Uh, there's, a, there's a good question in the chat about how would this perform with low frame rate movies around 10 Hertz? That's the question in the chat. I wanted to kind of broaden that a little bit. And as, since you are trying to um, interpolate between two adjacent frames, um, intuitively, it seems like it would do much better at very low frame rate. We got high dwell time per pixel. So you have like, you know, you're doing some averaging in each individual pixel already. Whereas if there's a lot of um, shot noise dominating the images at, as you get with really high frame rates where there's relatively little um, signal, I, I, I guess that would be bad. But I, I wondered if you could comment on the imaging parameters that make this work really well and give impressive results and what parameters may make it not perform as well as you might like. Yes, um, so I haven't pushed the frame rate too much in, in the, the, the higher end, um, but intuitively you actually, it's, it, you, it, you you care more about oversampling essentially. So because if the noise noise short noise is not the presence of noise is not a problem. But what you want to have multiple samples with different instances of that noise. Um, and so uh, I and, and so that's one aspect. The second aspect is you want to be as close to the raw data as possible because the independence is important. Because if if you if you if you incorporate a averaging in your data pipeline, um, that's just going to allow the network to predict uh, this averaging. And so you, you, want, you want to remove all of these pre-processing steps as much as possible that are that are incorporated. So actually, I'm, I'm going to the other direction that you suggested. Um, the faster frame rate is, is, is better uh, uh, because those independents are not a problem. That's the, the second. Uh, then in terms so, of frame well, rate, then, then relatedly, uh, you know, what we do a lot of times is that we, uh, there's, there's some time integration per pixel. You don't have to do that, particularly for like some of our deep multiplexing, we're running a, a gigahertz out of the PMT. And so uh, I could imagine that it might actually be better to go ahead and take like 4,000 samples per line 
um, rather than just 512 samples per line, even though it might not be very meaningful data to our eyes, would that help the, the algorithm? You want to you want a guaranteed independence, and so you know when you choose the dwell time, it should be uh, longer than this integration. And so, uh, if if pixels start to leak from one to the next, uh, it's going to be able to predict those artifacts. Um, and so that's that's what I I would recommend. Um, in terms of uh, going low in frame rate, I've 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 trained this on five hertz, ten hertz. 30 hertz with with success. Um, if if it, it, as long as very those relationship between nearby samples are strong and and the noise do not have relationship, it it's gonna it's gonna leverage those. Okay, I, uh, and just one more question that popped up in the chat. Um, this is from EU. It was a postdoc in in my lab. Dr. Lecoq, I, I, uh, sorry I don't have a microphone on my PC right now. The deep interpolation is awesome. I've played with this a little bit. I'm wondering whether a trained model can be used to interpolate a new data set from the same recording system, the same two-photon microscope, same indicator, um, same pixel resolution. Yeah, so uh, in at the, uh, so there's two, uh, so at the Allen, I've trained uh, a network broadly. So there was a, something like 850 experiment that were randomly shuffled during training. And so that gives you a general purpose denoiser. Uh, and the approach with converging on the, at, internally at the Allen Institute pipeline is to have this broadly trained network uh, and then fine tune it on each individual experiment very quickly. So then, because sometimes this, deno this denoising deep learning network, uh, they have uh, some adjustment that can be helpful to do, especially like the, the bias and things like that, that can cause um, uh, sort of prediction errors. And because this approach is self-supervised, we found that the best performance was having like a large train network that is very close to the solution and then fine tune very quickly on each individual experiment and then you run it. That's, that's what I recommend. Um, and this also limit the amount of uh, compute needed because the fine tuning can be done very quickly. Um, you could also, if, if your experiment are very close to one another in condition, you could probably uh, bypass the fine tuning. That's what I did for the paper. Uh, for a lot of, of experiment, but I just found that the fine tuning gives the best performance and you don't have to worry about uh, any issues. Uh, okay. So if I'm missing the chat button, maybe I should click it on. <laughs> uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, do you see a cat? Casper just asked another question as well. Uh, I can't, uh, yes. So you cross validate is very risk overfitting. So, um, of a, so there's two kinds of overfitting here uh, that could happen um, in the traditional machine learning. Uh, the, the, the first kind that a lot of people are worried about is noise overfitting. So if you were to start, you would be starting predicting the, the short noise, essentially. Um, and, and this is challenging to uh, completely uh, manage in this case because, um, because the loss, when, if the loss goes to zero, it means you're, you could either be overfitting the short noise or the, the relationship between pixels. And so I, I decided to just uh, avoid the noise overfitting altogether by just presenting each sample only once. Um, and um, and that, that eliminate this problem from the equation. Uh, you probably need a lot more than once, probably a like, hundred times so that it starts to memorize the short noise. But we have so much data in calcium imaging that this just eliminate the problem. Um, and so and in, in, at the Institute, we had billions of frames. So that was an easy thing to do. Uh, so I, I, I recommend following that practice because we have so many frames. Uh, and so this eliminate short noise overfitting. Uh, now, the second part is uh, potentially overfitting the distribution of pixels in one experiment to another. Um, and that can happen if your, noise, if your model is, is, not, is not trained pro well. 
And so that's why I recommend this fine tuning uh, at the beginning of each experiment. It's very quick. So um, you just take your generally trained model, fine tune it on the experiment for like a half an hour or so, and then you eliminate this, uh, this over, overfitting problem. Can I, um, can I ask a clarifying question there? So yes. you, you, you talk about presenting every frame just once, right? Yes. I mean, in, prin in principle, um, you know, if, if during training, uh, the network sees something that it's going to see in test, even if it sees it only once, there's like, in my mind, there's still a potential of overfitting, right? And the, um, perhaps a different, the, pro the strategy that I would have thought about would be to actually just like split the data, train on half the data, and infer on the other half, and then you know train on the other half and and infer on the first half. So, what is it about presenting at, at every frame only once that actually prevents overfitting? Um, um, I mean, it it, it because it, it's only going to overfit on that pair because the noise is independent, right? And so, if if it's learning one frame really well and it's presented with it only once, it's gonna it's gonna just present it once. Um, but it because it, it, the learning rate is so low is low enough that I haven't seen instances of uh, of re, re, short noise picking up if if you're just presenting once. I think it I think it's an engineering it's an engineering aspect. Uh, if you present the same frame many many times over, the network is going to find a space in this higher dimension spot where it it re, it re re re, re split out the noise. But uh, if you present only once, I've seen it never happens. Okay, but you, you don't do any sub subdivision of the data and train multiple models so that you never test on the same thing that you train. Yeah, you know, in 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 uh, quantification of validation loss, we split. Yes. Um, okay. So, and it and 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 it's easy to do also in uh, in if you have only one movie, you can keep the beginning for measuring validation loss and the rest for training. Um, I I understand. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Spencer, you have. Yeah, so yeah. I have a, a couple slides on architecture. We can go back to that. So this this architecture is is uh, that we have on the slide here is a, a result of exploration uh, for the paper, and I've done a little more work since to optimize it. Um, uh, and and this because you can the, the 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 approach the principal approach is not tied to a particular architecture. You could even use transformer networks in the middle. Um, I've used UNet because they've been shown to work really well with image processing uh, uh, machine learning approaches. Uh, the skip connection here absolutely essential. I found it helps to make the loss landscape smoother. This has been shown by other people. Um, and I experimented a little bit with the depth of the network initially, uh, and, and I converged to this particular architecture uh, for the paper, but I have a little more slides on this uh, to the end. Um, all right. And so then once you've, once you've trained it, uh, you, and we've done a little bit also of architecture search for the paper, changing the number of pre and post frame before the center frame. Uh, so you see here is the is a measure a measure of the validation loss on you know held out data as uh, uh, Casper mentioned, and we found that uh, actually longer uh, pre and post uh, section uh, provided better uh, validation loss on this held out data, um, and I and actually push it to thirty frames, and at the time it was getting to the limit of my computational capacity. Uh, um, but today I probably could push it uh, further. Um, and what you see here is, is example frames here. Um, um, this is a raw frame. As you train, you see that uh, very uh, quickly you actually get a pretty decent solution. Uh, and as you train more, it starts to resolve fine structure with more details. Um, and uh, the, the, the nice aspects about it is that you can actually can take single pixels uh, as you know as, uh, from from the movie and see a very well reconstructed uh, uh, calcium event uh, on top of that pixel. And so the SNR is improved at the single pixel level, uh, which you know the 
the traditional approach in, in, in CASOM imaging pipeline is to extract the whole region of interest uh, to, to get the cast, is to essentially increase your photon flux. That's what we, we do. Um, and, but here, because we leverage all of this relationship across the entire spatial temporal uh, uh, sample, uh, we actually can achieve better SNR for each individual pixel. And this has, uh, uh, and this is, uh, and this is an example here, uh, what you see. So this is a rod that I set on the top. It's very similar to the first example I show you. And on the right, I mean subtracted uh, the movie so, to, so that you could see uh, the, the presence of, uh, of this shot noise a little more clearly. And the bottom left is uh, after deep interpolation and on the bottom right is the same mean subtraction. Um, and so I'm gonna play that movie so you see um, that the, the, the beauty is that now it, it sort of reveal very small compartment dynamic. Uh, it's, it's much, much easier to see uh, um, uh, individual processes um, and, 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 and its activity. And if you look closely, uh, you might notice also it's doing a little bit of motion correction because uh, at each individual frame, uh, motion artifacts are independent from, from one frame to the next. And so, they cannot be predicted. And so he's taking the, 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 the average of all possible uh, frames there. And I have uh, a couple of, uh, other example on the next slide. So this is a, it relates to your question. In this case, I train a very broad network and apply it to many different examples. This was held out movies. They were not present during training. Um, and so you see that the same network can actually perform pretty well across a broad range of, uh, of uh, SNR and, and imaging conditions, uh, which you see uh, uh, from, from comparing the top to the bottom. Um, and, and we also apply this to, uh, to different um, imaging modalities, uh, instruments that were recorded at lower frame rate and so on and so forth. Now, in the next few slides, uh, uh, there's a couple, there's one question. Yes, is it better to do motion correction before denoising or does it matter? So uh, this network does not have motion correction capabilities. And so uh, what I've done is I, I apply motion correction prior, so to, to bring them closer um, and then train on motion, motion corrected movies. Uh, you could, there are some, uh, some deep learning uh, possibility to incorporate motion correction in the network, but I haven't done that. Um, in the next few slides, I'm gonna uh, talk about validation. So this was uh, uh, an important aspect of this work um, because in principle, you could say it looks beautiful, Jerome, but uh, I don't trust the data. I mean, I don't know what the, the network is hallucinating. Um, so how do you validate uh, the, the result that, is, that is, the network is giving? And so we did a couple of things here. Um, the first thing is uh, leverage uh, work um, done by uh, Adam Song. Um, it, it was published uh, two years ago in uh, engineer science. So it's a, it's a really real, I, I will call it hyper-realistic simulator. And so uh, this slide is entirely from the simulator. So this is fake data. Um, and, 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 and the beauty is that it, it looks so real, but uh, it, it's sort of, uh, in, it's an incentive for me to use because uh, it's gonna be very close to, to the real data set. And so I can now have access to the ground truth. And so what we did is we trained, we used this uh, uh, largely trained network and fine tune it on the, uh, on the uh, raw data of the noisy uh, version on the right and compare what the outcome uh, with the ground truth. Uh, so this is this slice here, um, and we, are, we also compare it with other approaches in the field, um, um, penalized matrix de decomposition, which is like an over denoising approach, uh, Gaussian kernels, noise to void, uh, so as to see uh, the, 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 the quality of the reconstruction. So what we did is that essentially the L2, we measured the, the reconstruction loss, and, but now we compare it to ground truth, so it's a meaningful uh, loss. And we found that uh, uh, this approach outperformed other methods in terms of reconstructing the, the ground truth uh, uh, response when it was trained properly. And, and one advantage that you see here on the right is when you look at individual event, 
um, it allow, also allows to preserve the fast uh, calcium dynamic, as opposed to what you will see, for instance, with a Gaussian kernel. So uh, Gaussian kernels are used in the field uh, to measure, to, to remove noise widely, and they are well understood, but they, they impact also the signal, and which is one aspect we're trying to avoid here, is preserve the signal underneath. Um, uh, now, uh, once we've done that, uh, and, and I'm sure uh, Andrea will be interested, um, we've compared what, what happens with segmentation when, when you denoise like this. And so you saw that the movies, after denoising, they're much crisper, much more stable, and you see, can see individual elements. So it's likely going to help segmentation. Um, and so this is what you're looking at here. We've, we've, we've compared the, the region of interest that I extracted with Sweet2P or Kaiman uh, with and without uh, this uh, denoising step. And so you could use uh, deep interpolation in that way. So just use it to improve the region of interest uh, if you will still want to use the, the raw traces. Um, and so you see on the bottom panel here, uh, this is our cell match. So we are matching region of interest with and without deep interpolation. And you see that when the cells has fairly good SNR, the filters, they looked exactly the same as you, as you can see here. So the improvements are when the, when the region of interest is, is much more noisy to start with. And there, uh, adding these denoising steps, uh, recover sometimes missing portion of the soma or even attach processes, uh, as you can see in this example here. So that's for sweet 2 p And I was pleased to see that sweet 2 p had a denoising in their pipeline, not this with after, after our work. So I think it's important to add denoising. Um, Kaiman uh, as a belting denoiser, um, but uh, they use a different approach. Um, the impact that we saw in to Kaiman is is related to how they merge uh, uh, filters together. So you see here an example here. Uh, this cell. Uh, so in Kaiman, because of it's a memory intensive, they process subsection of the image separately, and then they have a step to merge. Uh, uh, component together. Um, and, and what we found is after denoising, uh, this process works much better. So some components are recovered. So in, for instance, in this case, the, the, the cell was missing the top part uh, and in the raw data, but is recovered with, uh, with a deep interpolation here. There's a, a question from Arshida. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a question about whether um how deep interpolation performs when you're looking at calcium activity outside of the soma? Oh, uh, you mean uh, dendritic processes? Yeah. yeah, so this is, I have an entire project that is still ongoing about this um, okay. because it, uh, one thing that I would like to do is reprocess the entirety of the Allen Institute data set to extract dendrites. I'm sure Casper will be interested. Um, but uh, yes, it's a, a huge opportunity uh, because uh, essentially now all of these dendrites are easier to segment. Uh, and so right. um, uh, it, 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 it allows you to take benefit of the entirety of the data set. Okay, thank you. Have you thought about, so, so as, I, as I look at like this ROI8, I have, I, I have a question. I'm sure you've thought about this. Have you thought about whether there's like a regression to the mean issue? where uh, let's say that two things are generally highly correlated, right? Um, and so, you know, one thing is predicted by the other, uh, but, but then there's some small amount of independent activity. And, you know, sometimes we care about the independent activity, right? Uh, is there a smearing that occurs because, uh, you know, because of basically the correlation between two things is high uh, and, yes. the, yeah, and, and the variance decreases, even when it's real? Yeah, so um, um, so the the uh, the denoiser has a sort of receptor field size of about um, uh, I think it's uh, sixty micron. So it it it, it could it could incre it could in uh, had correlation. So I think you're what you're talking about within that that region, um, and so. Uh, yes, if you if you train the model poorly, you could you could do that, and so that's why I advocate for this fine tuning step. But because um, in in 
in if if it, if if the network introduce uh, artifacts, it's going to show into the validation loss. And so, if you train your network, you should it should it's it's incentivized to decrease that validation loss, and and that means removing all of these artifacts. And so, uh, so I think that will happen if the network is not trained properly. Um, and I and I agree with you that would be a problem. So this is why I'm advocating for that. I'm advocating for this fine tuning for every movie so that it's not happening. Um, yes, and so I think it's a software engineering problem more than than uh, than uh, uh, than over. Yeah, and I have. I, if I could just put the, I, I don't want to speak for Casper, but but maybe he's thinking the same thing. I mean, if you've got a dendrite and you've got a bunch of spines on it. The, the signals are going to be completely dominated by backpropagating action potentials and be this huge signal. Deep interpolation might completely obliterate all the individual independent um, spine signals that are there. And um, since you're already doing this, maybe, maybe this is in the work that you're doing right now, but I just wondered if you had it, could, could comment on how to avoid that. So you're worried about um, uh, introducing artifacts into dendrites. Well, yeah, basically, if, if, if what I'm interested in is the independent component of spine signals um, that, are, that, are in, that are separate from the backpropagating action potential calcium signals and dendrites, um, if I run deep interpolation on it, is it, going to is, is it going to tend to corrupt those independent signals that are at dendritic spines? Because um, they're going to be really well correlated with what's happening at the dendrite but there is going to be some independence and that's exactly what I want to pull out of it. That's, that's, yes, yes, that's yes. one piece of data that I want out of it. And there may be, I, I mean, I, this is a qualitative conceptual thing, but I, it, I can see how, I, I can imagine how deep interpolation may, may um, average over that. Yes. Um, I, I think the independence that I'm talking about is about is around a single frame, single pixel. And so your event is still going to be correlated across times and space, right? If, 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 if you're talking about something that if, happens if, only in one frame, only in one pixel. Fair, yeah, yeah, fair. fair. Uh, ideally, you would have enough, you would have multiple pixels, like say at least like 10 pixels on that spine and that and the transient would last more than one frame. I, I agree. Yes, yes. I, so, I'm so, saying that that would save you. I think yes, because but there's sure signal between shared pixels around. And so if you train it properly, it should be able to predict it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it, I agree. It, it's, it's a matter of validating your network properly and making sure it, it's not introducing those. Um, okay. I haven't done this analysis in depth, uh, you know, looking at backpropagating dendrites. So I, I won't be able to speak to that, uh, precisely. All right. Um, I'm, I'm glad we're having this debate. I think it's an important one. Uh, so um, uh, this is a slide about uh, quantification. How, how am I doing this time? Yes, I, I want to keep 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 time for for the for the demo. So I have ten minutes, Spencer. Uh, yeah. So um, ten thirty is the the next one, so, and we're at uh, nine fifty right now by my clock. So there's another forty okay. minutes. Okay, we still have time. Uh, so uh, this is a quantification of SNR across uh, uh, different compartments, so somas, uh, dendrites, and, and axons. And the SNR here is just defined as the, uh, the measure of the, the fluctuation in the background divided by the mean. And um, if, if we want to detect uh, uh, calcium events that are 10%, you, you want this SNR to be above 20. Uh, essentially. And so uh, what we are showing here is that uh, previously um, you will be able to detect this 10% change in delta f over f um, in, in the cells that are above 20. So that will be, a, a in that example, a subset of all the ROI. And so after denoising, essentially all of them get above that threshold. And so that, that, that should allow you to detect uh, smaller events much more easily. And uh, we've also, to go towards biology, we've used the Allen Institute uh, 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 visual stimuli, which are natural movie, to look at the response reliability of region of interest to the stimulus. So the, the network has no knowledge about the stimulus that is presented to the mouse. And in, in all cases, we found that the cells are more reliably responding to that stimulus 
uh, after denoising. And so, uh, and, and this is expected if you just remove independent noise, uh, like short noise, because the, the mean of all of the correlation is gonna go up. And, and we've done this toward uh, across both small and large compartment. And so uh, what you see here is um, the quantification of the response to natural movie. Um, and so uh, all of this region, all of this ROI here are colored uh, by the, the time the response to the natural movie and, and the response reliability. And what we found is that the, the small and large compartment in that example, have the same similar distribution. So you, you could argue that the, the smaller compartment uh, uh, will show a different distribution if the network is not doing its job well. But, uh, but because you're recording from the same area of the brain, that's what you would expect if the denoiser was doing its job correctly. So if you look here at the reliability of the, the somas and the smaller compartment, they follow a similar distribution in that experiment. Uh, so some control that you can do uh, to speak to uh, to some of your comments earlier. Um, and, and you see here, this is sort of the reliability is measured by looking at how this calcium traces is uh, reliable from each presentation of the movie. Um, this uh, speak to uh, um, uh, some of the, the, the signal, uh, this, uh, there's a, 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 an important concept, concept in system neuroscience with the, uh, the signal and noise correlation, which is meant to analyze the reliability of the response, uh, the single trials or the average response. And so there's a lot of papers that are analyzing this in the field and, and they're using calcium imaging to do that. And so uh, what we are doing here is just duplicating a little bit of this analysis to show that uh, the, the signal correlation across the whole field of view is going up. And so, um, and, and this is uh, uh, illustrated on this, uh, on this figure here. And this, this increase in signal correlation uh, is, is related to the visual stimulus, uh, but it's also present across region of interest that are very far apart, which the network has no way to, uh, to, uh, to know because the, as I said, the receptive field is limited uh, of, of the convolutional network. Okay. So um, we're getting into a how in practice how to do this. So um, uh, it's great, but you have this large network. So how, how can you use it on data set that was not trained on? And so, um, and, and I've, I saw this early on, um, you see this sort of instances of, uh, of a, a, a wrong prediction uh, when you use the network to, to a condition that's never seen before. So this is an example of layer six recording that was not present in the training data. Um, and this is a very noisy experiment. Uh, so I'm, I'm playing it here. Uh, so you're imaging layer six, the signal is dimmer. Um, and when you apply uh, the denoiser, but it was not trained on layer six data, you see this in the middle. And so it, you might argue it's, it's, it's not so bad <laughs> uh, looking at it, uh, but if you look carefully, you see that there's a little bit of background flickering here. Um, and after fine tuning, uh, my experience is that all of this uh, uh, background artifacts are, are essentially gone. Um, and the, 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 the nice aspect of this is because it's self-supervised, you can use the movie itself to do that. And, and I found that the, the amount of training was, was minimal uh, to recover the performance. Uh, so the majority of the gains was within the first 10,000 frames uh, of, the, of the training uh, uh, period. So it's likely that uh, you have enough data in your individual experiment to, uh, to fine tune this experiment. Um, and this is just a brief slide. Uh, we've applied this to neural pixel recording as well uh, and, and, uh, and show improve uh, number of unit detected while preserving the amplitude of, uh, of the events. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into that, um, but the, the architecture and the problem is exactly the same. NeuroPixel is doing imaging, but with just a very thin, uh, very thin bend. Uh, I'm going to keep that. Okay, so I wanted to keep some time to go through the to the notebook. So the code is available on GitHub. Uh, the entirety of the code, the code to replicate the figures of the paper is available on GitHub. There's also data 
uh, that is uh, on Dropbox that we use for the paper. Uh, uh, the majority of all the movies that we use for training is also available on AWS. Uh, on the notebook, we're going to go through. I'm using. I'm actually accessing some of this movie uh, to illustrate the process. Uh, I also have a Slack channel that I've been. I've been doing, trying to do my best to support people uh, using this. Um, and, uh, and now I'd like to, to speak a little bit about uh, some more recent uh, work. Uh, is there any more questions? No, good. Uh, so uh, the network I presented you uh, in the, and is in the paper is about 150 megabytes. Uh, and they are, uh, it's, it's very large and it actually was challenging for people to adopt. Uh, and I, and I, so I, um, and because it's using, because it's so large, um, uh, it, it, some people did not have the hardware to use it. And it was also making the inference longer. And so I put some effort into uh, hyper, doing a little bit of a hyperparameter search on uh, a little more depth uh, to understand how to optimize this uh, uh, a little bit. And uh, so here, and I thought this would be helpful for the context of the workshop. Um, I'm showing you how the network is constructed. Uh, so you see that uh, there, uh, and so this is a, so a network I, I wrote for this hyperparameter search. There's four parameters to construct the network. One is uh, this feature called feature increased power, network depth, number of feature scales, and 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 um, I thought there was four. So a unit unit here. And so by tweaking these parameters, you actually can change the architecture of the network, making deeper uh, or wider, or having a larger feature layer. And I'm also true through this uh, uh, feature increased power, I'm changing the speed at which the feature layer increase as it goes deeper in the network. So the traditional architecture in UNET is to have this very wide network going in with a, a very long convolution, and then to decrease to decrease the, the, the size, so to sort of to do max pools, as you see here, and then increase the feature layer. So you're actually transforming transla uh, tr translation information into translation invariant information. And then you, you decode again to expand again. And so I play a lot with uh, uh, these parameters to see whether there was a way to decrease the number of parameters in the network. Jerome, <laughs> yes. Uh, regarding architecture, I, I've been wondering whether, uh, have you tried feeding in like a global mean image or, so let, let's say you take a global mean image of, of your recording or for, every, for any given pixel, you, you make a local correlation image and feed not only the local timing of the video, but actually that global information. Yes. Um, uh, it seems like, so basically your fine tuning, you know, learns about the structure of the particular recording. Like it, it learns about, you know, where the neurons are, where their dendrites are. And I imagine that a lot of what it's learning is something like, you know, the mean of each pixel and its correlation to, to the neighbors. Have you tried feeding that in to the, to the convnet? Uh, so, uh... It just just something I didn't mention. Um, it, a traditional approach in it is is standard in deep learning to to subtract the mean and divide by so to, to bring all the pixels between the minus one and one. So so to avoid sort of uh, 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 parameters going crazy. Uh, and so I actually for every experiment I subtract the mean. Uh, and and then uh, and so I'm only asking the network to predict uh, uh, value outside of the mean. Got it. And so, uh, I so, mean, there's, there's there's some information in there potentially, but yeah, but I, yes, I understand could, why you want to normalize. You could you could you could uh, alter the information that is fed in here. I haven't explored too much on that end, um, but you I, know, I mean, I just just, ima just imagine the problem. I mean, I think you I think you understand what I'm getting at. Just imagine the problem. If if I feed you a a little chunk of noisy data, uh, you have a very hard problem. Uh, and I bet you'd want to ask, what does this local chunk of noisy data look like on average globally? And yeah. Yes, you could you could alter it. Um, I haven't tried this direction. Okay, uh, I'm just curious if you tried it. Sorry, it's no, that's fine. That's Thanks. fine. It's meant to be interactive. Um, so I don't have all the plots uh, to share, uh, but um, by doing this hyperparameter search, you see that I've, I have four parameters. 
Um, I was able to sort of uh, actually get very vast gain uh, here. Um, Ryan, do you have? Oh yeah, we just have um, a question in the a chat. Um, so as someone who's not at all a computational scientist, what all other than the HD5 file do I need to run deep interpolation? Uh, let's keep that for the notebook. I, I, okay. I think I think that'll, that'll be the good time to discuss that. Um, so, and, and the reason I have this slide is because it's part of the notebook. Uh, so you see that uh, here, as the the I, what I found is that, uh, for instance, if you take the the feature multiplication per layer, so this is the the input size, uh, that the 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 increase the improvement on the validation loss was minimal after this was 30, and so I, I so I fixed the value to 32 because I found that going below will give problems, and so I converged to this set of parameters here uh, on on the on, through this uh, meta parameter search, and it's actually at 100x smaller, um, and so you see here uh, this is a an, uh, an example movie. So you compare the left and the right, and you see that it's giving very similar results, uh, even if the architecture is significantly small. And so, and so, so what I what actually this does remove is uh, it's actually make a, a smaller bottleneck in the in the trough of the network, uh, and because I found I was probably my this parameter was too large and unnecessarily large in the initial architecture. Uh, and so the, the, uh, before I go into the notebook, I want to make sure I thank uh, Michael, Josh, Peter, Christoph, and Natalia um, for this work, because this was teamwork. Um, okay, and uh, the reason I'm, I'm excited by this is because now the thing run on Google Colab. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, so you can actually do this uh, uh, on your own uh, without uh, sort of having to have to complicate the hardware. Uh, so I, I invite everyone to sort of click on, on this link uh, and, and then uh, click on the little uh, uh, Google Colab button here. And so uh, uh, what you should see here is, is a, a, a hosted a notebook that is on Google Colab. And, and so it's using the GPU on Google Colab, everything. Uh, and so if you do uh, run all here, um, yes, <laughs> uh, uh, it's gonna install the package. Uh, so I actually made a specific version for this that is a little more memory efficient. Um, and so I'm gonna put this in the main branch soon. Um, turns out that using Google Colab is good to push you towards efficiency. Uh, and so that was a, a benefit of this workshop. And so it's installing the package uh, for you and it's using the TensorFlow version of Google Colab. Um, and then on the second step, it's improving, the, it's importing the, the key component of the package. So uh, we actually uh, uh, reorganized the code base uh, this year um, together with the technology team at the Allen Institute uh, and, and made a better uh, command line interface uh, system. And so we, now we have this fine tuning and inference package uh, within, the, within deep interpolation. And so if you import this, uh, it's gonna make it available to the notebook. And then uh, this step is, uh, is actually mounting uh, S3 buckets. Um, so those buckets are uh, hosting uh, thousands of movies of the Allen Institute. Uh, so they're stored in HDFI files. So it's modding this as a, as a folder available um, uh, to the notebook. Um, and so you could change this to an S3 bucket that you own uh, to, to sort of uh, use your own movies there. Um, and then it's picking one of these HDF5 movie, uh, the HDF5 has be time X, Y in, in direction. Um, and, and you tell it, oh, do you want, I want to save the, the output to that path, which is local. Um, then uh, this step is to uh, copy a subset of your movie locally. So uh, Google Colab has a limit in storage space. Uh, so. I could not store the entirety of the 50 gigabyte movie. Uh, there are alternative ways. You could have a Google Drive 
that is mounted here to have more space. But for this notebook, I want it to be in the, within the limit of the free package. Um, so this is copying 500 frames of the data, of the Allen Institute data raw after motion correction uh, to a files uh, that is here. So this is this file. We, it just copied it as, we, as I was talking. Um, and then uh, it's downloading from Dropbox this uh, optimized network that I made available and, uh, and storing it. Uh, uh, yes, in this file, it's a, a one megabytes now. Before it was 150. Um, and then uh, it initialized a training object. So now the notebook is doing training for you. Um, and it's, it's setting up parameters. Uh, so um, what's relevant here is this office generator is using an HDF5 loader um, that we wrote into the package. If you, if you have TIFF files, uh, you want to use the single TIFF generator. So you just change this to single TIFF generator and it should work in principle, hopefully. Uh, uh, I've, I've been helping a lot of people in the last year. And so I've seen, uh, I'm hoping that the Google Collab is going to simplify things because you don't have to install uh, too many dependencies. Um, and then uh, you set the parameters. Uh, so these 30 and 30 here are the parameters of the, this train model. And so you want to use those. Um, and then uh, you set the start and end frame of the, of, uh, of the, the, for the training frames you want to use. So minus one is until the end. So you can, as Casper said, you can select the subset uh, that, that you deem useful for training. Um, and then you say, oh, I want to use that number of frames for training. So I recommend uh, 10,000 frames. It's going to work on this Google Colab notebook, but for this sake, I limit it to 500 uh, so that we can see the outcome during the workshop. Um, this parameter is set to zero uh, for classroom imaging. This is just the size of the, uh, of the center frame occlusion. Uh, so uh, in, for instance, in some cases, you're going to have a noise correlation uh, between consecu consecutive frames. Uh, for instance, in E phase, there's a little more correlation. For two photon, this is the, one of the most beautiful examples of independent noise. Uh, so um, only one frame is enough for occlusion. Um, and then this is the test generator. So is a, a, a generator for training and the generator for uh, measuring the performance. And so there you can set uh, a separate set of frames uh, for measuring the performance. In this case, I'm using 100 frames uh, for measuring the performance that are randomly distributed across the movie. Um, and then you call this object uh, called the transfer trainer and set the path to a uh, to the model. So this is the pre-trained model that I gave on Dropbox. Um, and then, uh, and then you, uh, you set some parameters to the fine tuning objects. Um, these parameters is, I, I explained it a little bit. Uh, I have a, a peculiar definition of epoch. And the reason being is that um, in, in these movies are so large, we have many, many, many more frames than needed for training. And so because I have this scheme of only presenting frames once, um, it, uh, the traditional definition of an epoch is going through the entirety of the data set. But in my case, I couldn't do that because the data set is too large. And so I define uh, epoch a little more uh, um, uh, uh, differently. So it's just uh, the, the number of batches um, in between validation measurements. So essentially it goes to a certain number of batches and then measure validation loss and then move on from there. Uh, so you can, so this parameter is, is just gonna, if you, if you set it smaller, you're gonna see more validation loss measures. It's gonna slow down your training. Uh, this is the learning rate. Uh, you can play with that. I found that around those numbers works well. Uh, I recommend the mean square loss in most cases. Um, uh, because it works with both uh, a low and high uh, SNR regime. If you have a lot of photons, the, 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 uh, the L1 might actually work uh, also well. 
uh, that is going to make you a little more resilient to motion artifacts. Uh, but I, I, I think this is the more general case. Um, and then these parameters are uh, relevant to the Google Colab. Just leave them as this. And then uh, it's already done training as I was talking uh, with this set of parameters. So you see um, the validation loss here is, 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 is not improving too much because it's a pre-trained. It's actually pre-trained on very similar data set. Um, um, but it's, it's saved the model in this output folder here. Uh, so that should be, uh, this file, the transfer model. And then once it's done this, it's going to inference. And so you actually can tell, please do inference on the entire movie here. Um, and, um, and, and the parameters are self-explanatory. I think there's, uh, one. Um, a parameter here that is helpful, uh, I call it hot put padding. So, um, and, and we're gonna discuss that when I show you the example movie. Uh, so so this, this essentially went through the entire process. And so I, now once this is done, you can download the, this is the movie they just created. Uh, and uh, I downloaded it for the workshop uh, so that we don't have to wait. Uh, so you see, uh, on the left, this is the, the raw data. On the right, it's after denoising. Um, and so uh, you, you can compare them. Uh, I created this view in Fiji. So I just imported the 2000 Fiji and combined them side by side so we can, we can look at them. Uh, the advantage of output padding set to true is that um, because, uh, because it needs 30 frame before and after, at the very beginning of the movie, it cannot predict the frame. So you have 30 frames uh, where it does not have the data to predict the center. Uh, there are ways around this, uh, but uh, uh, I just decided to, uh, to output zeros there. So when you say output padding to true, it's gonna, it's gonna give you empty frames. Um, if you set it to false, then it's just gonna predict the part it can. So it's gonna truncate the movie uh, uh, accordingly. And so in this example, the first few frames are black, uh, as expected, but the timing is, is, is respected. So that's the advantage of having output padding to true is that you know that this frame is the same as this one on the left. They, they're one-to-one -one match. Um, yeah. And so you see that it's actually working pretty well here. Um, I guess, um, any question? I'm, I'm, I'm in the chat. Yeah. Uh, many questions, but they're sort of purposely for the type of imaging data I have. So I don't know if maybe I should just talk to you after. You're so, welcome to go on the uh, on the Slack channel. I'm happy to help. Thank you. Anyway, um, I'm, I've been also working on setting up a cloud formation system. It's not ready yet for uh, sharing, but essentially, uh, I've been working to set up the entire AWS pipeline with something that is automated where you drag files on, on an S3 bucket and you just take it, process, put it on an S3, like do, do this in series automated with scaling. Uh, but that's not, that's not ready for, uh, it's working, but it's not ready for the wider use. I've got a, a question. Um... So if we were wanting to run this locally on, so we've got a local HPC system and rather than getting, you know, large data files sort of elsewhere and, and then processing them, um, um, that might be the way to do it. Is, is that sort of straightforward or is, is it sort of quite, I mean, you mentioned sort of um, yes, a, so a bunch of things having to be sort of installed correctly. It's, so I found, so I've helped a lot of people through this process in the last year, and I found the biggest challenge is getting the GPU to talk well with TensorFlow. And every, it's somehow TensorFlow is moving so fast that uh, everybody is sort of installing something, doesn't work, and they, they sort of try things until the whole, mm -hmm. the drivers are aligned and they work well. Um, yeah. It's every, every TensorFlow version has new problems. And so this is why okay. I sort of am trying to provide yeah. this because it's facilitated. Okay. So, so be, be aware of potential, um, um, you know, TensorFlow um, 
Yeah, you have, you have to have the right CUDA, yeah. the right yeah. CUDA drivers, yeah. all of this. Um... Yep, good. Which is which is also why I'm working on this cloud formation thingy. I have a question. How so for uh, for your models? How specific are they for different parameters like magnification or the type of sensor? Oh yes. Do... Yeah, it's going to be very specific to your recording conditions. Uh, so that's why I recommend fine tuning, especially in those cases. Uh, okay, so so the fine tuning is enough to to account for that, or would it be uh, well, to... I've. I've I've done fine tuning with new frame rate and it seemed to work. Um, I can't I can't tell for your data before you know it's if your data is too different it could cause some problem and you have to train from scratch. Uh, I haven't seen that yet, but uh, it's it you know it, it's possible. I was curious, so everything we've been looking at is, is neural calcium, but have you tried this on any like calcium imaging from non-neural cells? So um, astrocytes are the first that come to mind. And we know that they have all these little micro domains. It may be something that, you know, is more applicable once you've, I think it sounds like you're optimizing more for like dendritic imaging and, and processing as well. And so, um, but yeah, I guess that the general question have, have these been applied or tried on, uh, calcium imaging for non-neural cells um, is also expanded to um, imaging for neurotransmitters, so like the glue sniffers, scatter sniffers, things like that. And so there, uh, there were some people that try on 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 uh, microglia. I think uh, it, I haven't. I have. I, I do not sort of too much direct experience. It, it. It. I don't see any reason why it would not apply there. Uh, but it, you know, it's an example where it's it's possible that there you you need, you'll need to have a more uh, uh, dedicated network uh, for those. Um, I mean, it also um, you have to think about uh, what is the dimension that you care about. Is it space or time? Like, it, it is is very is very dynamic, very important there because. Um, you might be well served with uh, uh, a single frame denoiser. You, you might not need to have the dynamic. So it, yeah, I would think about your application because the the duration of yeah, it makes having large frame before and after makes it computationally more heavy. Um, but I've I've done it on fMRI and NeuroPixel, so sufficiently broad, but. I think it's worth, um, th there's, there's sort of a thought in my head that, um, that uh, Harshida's uh, point made me think about that I think might be worth making explicit in, in, my, in my understanding of this. So the, the inference for any given frame is based only on other frames. But of course, that frame influences the predictions for the other frames, right? So if, if I, I, I'm having a thought experiment where let's say that there's random noise or, or sorry, not, not noise. Let's say your data are random and uncorrelated, right? Then the network has to predict all zeros, right? No matter how perfect your measurements are. Let's say your, your measurements are completely noiseless, right? Uh, and so obviously this, this method depends on the information being distributed to the other frames. Um, is, that, is that a good way of intuitively thinking about this? Yes, you have to have some shared some shared information between frames. Yeah, and actually the look, so the, the frame that you um, infer, like, so let's say you're inferring the 101st frame, that frame doesn't depend, doesn't depend on any of the information in that frame. Like if in that frame, all the pixels suddenly went black. The, yes, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's occluded. Yeah, so, so the information that you got on that frame appears in, all, in, in the other frames as part yes. of the inference. But the, the, the inferred frame depends only on information that was in other frames. And so I, th I think that's for, for the question of like, how would this work for other indicators? I think like a thing that I'm thinking about is what fraction of the information about what's happening in a given frame 
is actually acquired in that frame versus in the other frames. Yes. And for some indicators that might be uh, relatively little, like slower things or things where there's like, yeah, I guess slower things specifically. And for some it's not, it's, that's gonna be less true like super fast voltage imaging or super low frame rate imaging or something like that. Yes, I think, it, it, I think this kind of method advocate for maybe a different kind of experimental design, right? Where you, you want to oversample because uh, with two photon microscopy or the independence of noise is almost guaranteed, you know, because, and so you want to oversample. And, and if it's very noisy, it's not a problem, but you want to have a share information. So, you know, when we do, when we design, when we choose the frame rate, sometimes we actually care about the SNR of that frame in the raw data. And so, but, but what I'm saying is it doesn't matter uh, what you have coming in, but you want to have all, uh, shared information so that, and, and, and noise as, as restricted as possible to one frame. Um, so yes, it advocates for a different way to acquire the data. Well, thanks for your questions. Uh, this was uh, this was fun. <laughs>